Thank you for joining us today as we present this Getting Started with Groby webinar. Now I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today, Michael and David Nimi, Operations Research Analysts with Abramod. Abramod specializes in applying math programming to business problems across many industries. As background, Michael and David have personally helped many of Garobi's customers formulate business problems as math programming models, code the models so they can be solved with Garobi, do performance tuning, integrate models with other business systems, and train the end users. For the next hour, they will focus on sharing some of their experience implementing math programming models with Garobi. The goal is to help people less familiar with Garobi get up and running quickly while providing a few tips and tricks for more experienced users. And now I'd like to turn it over to Michael. Okay, so uh, welcome to the webinar on getting started using the Groovy Optimizer. The goal of this webinar is to formulate what was uh, perhaps the first linear program, the so-called diet problem, and we're going to also show how to solve that problem via Groovy using the Python interactive shell. So we're choosing Python uh, as a language for this presentation because it allows us to develop models interactively and also because Python code tends to be easier to follow than other languages, even if you haven't seen Python code before. Uh, you should be able to follow what's going on. Uh, but we'll note that Groby also has a complete API in other languages, such as Java, and .NET languages, uh, C++, R, MATLAB, as well as its native C. So the concepts that we're going to discuss today are more or less going to apply to all the APIs except for the C API. So we're going to solve a problem, and once the problem is solved, we're going to show how to query the solution related sensitivity information, and then show how to write the, the model to a file for future use, and how to analyze a model that has been read back in from a file. So the models we're going to look at today at their core are, are linear programs, as they're going to contain only continuous variables. But we'll show you how adding variables that are integer constrained to these models can increase your modeling power. So before we get to all that, let's briefly define the uh, linear program and some related terminology that we're going to need. So a linear program is really a special case of a more general class of problems known as mathematical programs. And here note that we're using the term program to mean a plan of action rather than a computer program. So a mathematical program consists of three components. First are decision variables, which are things that you control, constraints, which are rules that you have to follow when choosing values for your decision variables, and finally an objective function, which is what tells you, specifies what exactly you want to minimize or maximize. So in general, a mathematical program looks like the following. The goal is to compute values for the decision variables that satisfy uh, a set of constraints and that either minimizes or maximizes uh, an objective function, which we're calling f here. So those constraints are allowed to be any combination of equations and inequalities. And then finally, most mathematical programming definitions include non-negativity constraints, constraints that say that your variables cannot be negative. And we include those constraints here. Most problems uh, naturally have non-negativity constraints, but if your problem doesn't, that's okay. Uh, your problem can still fit into this framework after a simple transformation. So the output of this problem is a set of optimal values for the decision variables, which we call uh, XJ are, are decision variables. They're, they're called decision variables because their optimal values are what are ultimately going to guide your decision making. The constraints that involve functions of uh, more than one variable, so the GI greater than, less than, or equal to BI, those are called structural constraints, which we're going to distinguish from the non-negativity non constraints, which involve only a single variable. So a feasible solution is a list of values that satisfies all constraints, including both the structural and non-negativity constraints. And the objective function ranks the feasible solution. So the objective function takes in a feasible solution and returns a number that gives a measure of the quality of that solution. So popular candidates for objective functions are either cost or profit functions, depending on, uh, depending on your applications. Let's go ahead and talk about now what a linear program is. So a linear program is really a special case of the mathematical program in which both the objective function f and the functions and the constraints are required to be linear in the decision variables. So in this definition, the variable coefficients a and c, as well as the right-hand side b, are all fixed data that are known ahead of time. Our goal here is to find a special solution x star that has a property that when x star is evaluated by the objective, it produces a value that is no greater than the value of any other feasible solution, assuming that we're trying to minimize. So I'm not going to say that x star is the only solution that attains the minimum. So there's a possibility exists that uh, there may be multiple solutions that all achieve the same minimum value, and a mathematical programming solver is required to return any one of them. And so know that this definition is really just uh, it's a really special case of the definition that we gave for a general math program, but with F and GI's 
chosen in a special way. Specifically, F and GI chosen to be linear functions of your decision variables. So Groovy supports LPs, but it also supports some important extensions to linear programs, one of which we'll discuss later. With that, in the linear programming definition, uh, we weren't allowed to specify constraints that our variables were integer. Adding integer constraints to the model creates a different type of problem known as a mixed integer linear program, uh, which we'll get to uh, later on in this webinar. So let's go ahead and talk about the diet problem. And in fact, let's formulate a, a small instance of the diet problem, and we're going to go ahead and solve that using Groby through the Python interactive shell. So the diet problem is one of deciding how much of various food types to consume in order to satisfy nutrient requirements at a minimum cost. People typically study the diet problem early on when they're studying linear programs because it fits exactly into the linear programming framework. So we're given a set of foods and we're given a set of nutrients. And those foods contain nutrients and those foods have a cost. And we're given the, the cost per ounce of each of these five foods. And we're given limits, uh, we're given lower limits on the amount of each nutrient that, we're, that we need to, to consume in our diet. But that the more general version of the diet problem can have both lower and upper limits on our nutrients, but in this case, uh, just for simplicity, we're going to consider an instance that only has lower bounds. So we'll go ahead and formulate this problem as a, as a linear program. So to formulate a linear program, we need to find, find three things. Uh, our decision variables, the objective, the thing that we want to minimize or maximize, and finally, structural constraints, which are rules that we need to follow when making these decisions. So our decision variables are, are what in this case? So we need to know, uh, for each food, we need to know how, much, how many ounces of that food we're going to include in our diet. So our decision variable uh, xj is going to equal the number of ounces of food type j that we consume, or j here. Uh, well, we have five food types, so j is going to range from one to five. Our objective is to construct a diet at minimum cost, so we need to be able to write down the total cost of our diet in terms of our decision variables. Uh, so food type one, for example, uh, we're told that food type one costs $20 an ounce, and so therefore the total cost of food one in our diet is going to be 20, the cost per ounce, times x1, which is the number of ounces that we actually consume. All right, and similarly, the cost for food type 2 is going to be 10x2, and so on. We can write down the, the cost for each specific food type, and then summing those costs over all five food types is going to give us the total cost of our diet, uh, and that's our objective. That's the cost function that we're, we're seeking to minimize. And that cost function is uh, it, it's in terms it's written in terms of our decision variables and it's also linear, so we're fitting into the LP framework here. So that's our objective. Now we got to write down what constraints our, our diet has to follow. So we're given two nutrient requirements. So we're told that we have to consume at least 21 units of nutrient one and 12 units of nutrient two. So each of, those nutri uh, each of those nutrient requirements is going to translate into a structural constraint. Uh, so for nutrient one, what we need to do is figure out, in terms of our decision variables, how many units of nutrient one do we actually consume. And then we need to constrain that quantity to be at least 21. So how many units of nutrient one do we actually consume? Let's look at each food type in turn, figure out how many units of nutrient one that food type has, and then sum over all five food types. Food type 1 has two units of nutrient 1 per ounce. So food type 1's contribution to nutrient 1 is going to be 2 times x1. Food 2 doesn't have any of nutrient 1, so food 2's uh, contribution is 0. Food 3 has three units of nutrient 1 per ounce, so its contribution is 3x3, and so on. I can get every food type's contribution to nutrient 1, and then sum over all five food types, and that tells me how many units of nutrient 1 I actually consume, and that quantity has to be greater than or equal to 21, which is the minimum number of units of nutrient one that I have to consume in my diet. And similar logic can be applied to write down a structural constraint that's going to force us to consume at least 12 units of nutrient two. That gives us our two structural constraints, and then finally, uh, we can't consume a negative amount of any food type, so we're going to have non-negativity constraints on every decision variable. So xj has to be greater than or equal to 0 for all j, uh, ranging from 1 to 5. So now that we've formulated this diet problem as an LP, let's go ahead and see how it can be solved using Groby. 
object. In order to solve any model in the Groovy Interactive Shell, there's three objects and various methods that you're going to need to know how to use. So those objects are the, the model var and constor objects. The model object you can view is sort of a repository for all the data pertaining to the model. So you're going to construct a model object first, and then that model object has methods under it that allow you to build a model. So uh, there's four methods associated with a model object that you're going to need to know how to use in order to build our model. So the advar method is used to create decision variables, and that method takes in up to five parameters that we're going to discuss. It takes in a lower bound, upper bound on that variable, the objective function coefficient, the type of the variable, so v type allows you to specify whether a variable is continuous or if it's integer constrained. So for an LP, all our variables are required to be integer, and in this diet problem instance, all the variables are integer. But in some applications, you may have uh, variables that are integer constrained, and the v-type parameter is going to allow you to specify uh, whether your variable is continuous or integer. And finally, you can name your variables. So if you're uh, at some point in your development process, you're going to want to write out the model that you built using code to a file because you want to validate that the code you wrote is actually producing the model that you think it's going to produce. So the name parameter here is going to specify a name for your decision variable so that later on when you write out your model to a file, you'll be able to identify your variables. And the second method that we're going to use is the add constant method, and that add constant method allows us to instantiate structural constraints. The add constant method is going to take in two parameters. The first is the constraint that you're trying to add, and the second is the name of the, of the constraint. Again, the name of the constraint is going to be useful ultimately when we write this model out to a file. We'd like to be able to easily identify constraints by name. So every time you add a variable, a decision variable or a constraint to your model, it's going to increase the size of your model. So and increasing the size of your model has a cost associated with it. So Groby allows you to add all your decision variables at once and all your constraints at once. Uh, but the trade-off there is that you have to tell Groby when you're done adding your decision variables. You tell Groby that you're done adding decision variables by calling the update method. So you're going to add all your decision variables at once using calls to the advar method. And then you're going to call the update method to sync all those decision variables with the model all at the same time. And then once those decision variables are synced with the model, then you're going to add structural constraints to your model via the add constant method. And then finally, once all the decision variables and structural constraints have been added to your model, then you can optimize, then you can actually solve the problem by calling the optimize method.